I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. Well, hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and today we're going to look at Episode 6 of Flat Earth Clues by Mark Sargent. In this episode, Mark discusses the structure of the actual Earth. He once again continues his Truman Show analogy, showing that the Earth is nothing but an elaborate Hollywood set. So let's cue up the music and get it going. Flat Earth Clues Part 6 Depth Perception this is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This clue looks into the inevitable design question below the surface, or more specifically, how thick the flat earth design would need to be. To start, let's quickly recap the design features so far. A basic dome structure made up of advanced high density material thousands of miles wide and at least a hundred miles in height. The ceiling of said structure being projected upon by an ultra high definition system using super LED technology and a combination of 2D and 3D imaging to simulate all celestial bodies including sun, moon, stars, and so on. Well once again Mark is just demonstrating that his basic knowledge of the universe comes from Hollywood movies. While this makes an interesting tale, he neglects to mention certain rather essential items. For example, who repairs the broken LCD panels? Does the computer or whatever device controls all this ever break down or crash? Has there ever been a time in recorded history that the sky blinked out? What powers all of this? And in the ages of exploration, have we ever come back with any physical proof of this electronic dome? While well, Mark, at the very least, is an interesting yet slightly tragic figure, does he have a firm understanding of the barrier between fantasy and reality? Given this information that he's presenting, I think that that is in question. But I'll let the listener make up their own mind on that. Do continue, Mark. This ceiling is then protected by a scaling decrease in temperature and oxygen levels to the point where human life isn't naturally sustainable above four miles. The lower surface of the dome structure consists of an organic layout of continents grouped at the center, ensuring that no land bridge exists to the outer ring. This is then surrounded by hundreds of miles of salt water in order to limit sea travel. The salt oceans are then adjusted with a scaling decrease in temperature as the outer area is approached to the point where salt water freezes, forming icebergs, further reducing sea travel. The outer ring is then elevated to a height of 10,000 feet, reducing oxygen levels, and a buffer zone of 300 miles is created. This zone is devoid of all life forms that could be used as food, further discouraging land travel. Once again, we are confusing the Gleason AE map with an actual model of the Earth. We could do another AE map, this one centered on Sydney, Australia, and this problem of an ice wall is resolved and we have oceans that go right up to the edge. Even if we accept the obstacles that Mark outlines for the ice ring, we actually have been to Antarctica, we have sailed around it, uh, this is Admiral Byrd's expedition. A common theme of human history is mankind's ability to overcome obstacles, and in the case of Antarctica, we certainly have. That all sounds pretty good, but we left out one thing, depth. Keeping human beings away from the ceiling is easy, because it requires higher technology. Protecting the outer ring is a little more difficult, but can be accomplished with layers of negative reinforcement. Protecting the actual common ground is a different challenge because digging is basic. Everyone knows how to use a shovel, and most construction requires a generous amount of digging. In addition, natural resources such as coal, oil, minerals, are harvested through large-scale digging operations. 
So it's safe to say that any human population is going to be digging a lot of holes, because it's easy, and it's necessary to continue their way of life. That being said, how thick would you need to make the Flat Earth model so that people didn't accidentally dig their way through? You could use the same method as the outside barrier, and create a series of undesirable layers, ending in a solid barrier, but the ever-expanding increases in general population would create an unnecessary risk. If the bottom of the flat earth was composed of, say, an unbreakable material, this would pique the digger's curiosity, and if repeated all over the world, would raise suspicions of design. While a solid barrier works at the end of a frozen wasteland where no one is venturing, or allowed, it doesn't do much if it's found in a mining quarry, or someone's backyard. I would tend to agree with Mark on this. If there was a hard barrier under the ground that we could easily reach, I think our first question would be, well, what's beyond that barrier? Because, in general, that's what mankind does. When we are presented with a barrier, we seek to overcome it. For that, you need something that hasn't been used up to this point. A scaling increase in temperature, all the way to an ignition flashpoint, and then beyond. Now you will jump in and say, well of course, we all know that there is molten rock below the surface, we see it in volcanoes and, well, volcanoes. Why yes, we do have volcanoes. We actually have an entire branch of science devoted to understanding them called volcanology. We have another branch of science called plate tectonics that describes how they form and why they form and why they are located where they are located. Both these disciplines use physics, geology, and reasoning to understand how and why these are all natural processes. Yes, yes you do. And we've all seen the cross-section diagram of the globe Earth, which shows ever brighter bands of molten structure and so on, which is why I included the wiki link in the description that covers the official view of the Earth's structure. And I quote, Scientific understanding of the internal structure of the Earth is based on observations of rock in outcrop, samples brought to the surface from greater depths by volcanoes, analysis of seismic waves, measurements of gravitational and magnetic fields, and experiments with crystals at pressure and temperatures characteristic of the Earth's deep interior. In short, they have no clue on what's below them. None. You know, this is something that absolutely amazes me about the Flat Earth community. Mark just rambled off half a dozen ways that we interrogate the interior of our planet and learn more about it. For example, this diagram demonstrates the different propagation of waves from earthquakes based on whether they're going through a solid or a liquid material and hitting interfaces of the solid and liquid material. This is how we, well, it's just one of the ways that we discovered that the Earth has an inner and an outer core. Yet no sooner does Mr. Sargent identify these ways that we learn about the interior of our Earth than he just simply makes a hand wave and dismisses it. Now, while no idea in science is written in stone, they can always be challenged. You at least have to challenge them and say why they're wrong, and perhaps offer a better explanation that describes what they described. Mark does neither. He simply identifies them and then with a wave of his hand dismisses them. Very much like the people in the flat earth community tend to dismiss gravity as just a theory without fully understanding what is behind a scientific theory. Or do they offer any explanation for the consistent and universal 9.8 meter per second squared acceleration clearly measured at all points on the surface of the Earth, plus or minus one one hundredth of a percent? In fact, the deepest holes ever drilled, which I've also linked in the description, only go down eight miles. To repeat, no one has gone below eight miles anywhere. And every drilling survey is the same, a scaling increase in temperature to the point where drill bits stop working. And you come back and say, but volcanoes. Yes, there are volcanoes, holes in the earth where molten rock is produced, under pressure, I might add. 
by a fully natural and understood process, I might add. Certainly that can't be artificially created. No? We can melt rock right now. It's called a smelting plant. What do you think your car is made out of? Melted, reformed, and polished rock. We have the technology to do this. It all comes down to scale. Create a large set of furnaces at, say, 50 miles below the surface that can melt and pump molten rock. And you say, what would the furnaces be made out of? Oh, I don't know. How about the same dome material that can withstand nuclear weapons? So you take the molten rock, locate a few random access points on the surface, and the rest comes naturally. Again, this is a cool story, bro. But you don't have any evidence to suggest that you're right. Volcanoes are not located at random spots in the world. They are located in a pattern based on plate tectonics. This is an understood and natural process. What you don't put in is any evidence whatsoever that there are dwarfs underneath the earth smelting metal and smelting rock and pumping it up through random vents in the surface causing volcanoes. Where is the machinery? Where are the sounds of the machinery? Where is any evidence of piping or the ducts required to do this? What powers the smelting process? Who monitors it? Does it ever break down? These are all questions that you have no answer to, Mark. You expect people in the Flat Earth community to simply take it on your word. Is this science? I think not. It sounds more like religious faith or, at worst, a cult of personality you're attempting to develop. This is how it works because I say so just doesn't cut it. The Flat Earth is constantly saying we want measurable, observable, and reproducible facts. Well, why don't you start producing some? instead of coming up with these fantasies that are simply not verifiable. Volcanoes also reinforce the Earth structure model that the molten rock goes all the way to the core, which then in turn reinforces the globe model, and then we're back to where we are now. A smoldering globe flying through space at high speeds that from a design standpoint makes no sense. So how well, in light of the fact that this is a relatively well-understood process that is confirmed by geology and other studies, I really wouldn't consider it too off the wall, especially in light of the fact that you're talking about something that is completely unnatural and requires intervention, power, repair, etc. So how thick would the flat earth model floor need to be? Oh, for common use, say less than 100 miles, similar to the ceiling in scale. Large heat generators placed in a pattern, a thin layer of molten rock 10 to 20 miles down, which is really just a geologic pipe system to help with the generation of terrain. And there you have it, an efficient way of discouraging all those digging humans from reaching too far, combining a physical barrier with a mental one. Eight miles down and you're going to tell me what the entire core looks like? Give me a break. Mark, just take for a moment and consider the dome in the Truman Show. Look at the construction of it, the size of it, the amount of effort it takes to maintain it, to keep the water clean, to keep the actors fed, uh, the electricity on, the power on, to falsify all of the radio signals, just to fool one person. How much effort is being put into doing that? Now imagine that that is on a worldwide scale, and yet, even though all this effort, all this artificial construction is taking place, we have yet, in 2,500 years, found a shred of evidence supporting it. Where is a photograph of the dome? Where is a photograph of the edge? Where is a piece or a seismic record of any of this stuff going on underground that you're claiming. The spherical Earth is backed by 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and exploration. The flat Earth is a fantasy. 
designed by the imaginations of people that have far too much time on their hands and watch far too many fantasy movies. You can come up with all sorts of ideas sitting in a coffee house on the internet. Yet there are people in this world whose lives are devoted to trying to understand how corn plants grow or how to determine the location of pockets of oil under the ground. These are people that actually do science. A subset of those people teach other people how to do it. Perhaps you may want to take some of those classes. One of the keys to overthrowing an established scientific system is understanding that system. Based on this video, your understanding of geology, seismology, volcanology, and atmospherics are sadly deficient. You don't have the basic knowledge to understand the system to overthrow it. And until you do, you are going to continue to just spout fantasy. A common complaint in the Flat Earth community is that they are simply dismissed as being too ignorant or simply not understanding basic sciences. The problem is, is that with every video you guys put out, including this one, you demonstrate that that is the case. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel. This rabbit hole's too deep for me. Feel my brain getting real sore.